Welcome to the Discovery Doc Podcast, where we advocate for optimal wellness and reducing everyday toxic loads, no matter where life takes you. I'm Dr. Cece, doctor in nursing practice, self-proclaimed toxin tamer, and a crunchy mama. I'm Anna Kate, a medical mystery overachiever and your discovery liaison. Join us on this exciting journey as we explore the world of holistic health, cutting edge research, and practical solutions for a healthier life. Together, we'll navigate through the complexities of wellness, sharing valuable insights, and expert advice. Tune in to the Discovery Doc Podcast. Get ready to be inspired, empowered, and discover a whole new way of looking at your health. Welcome back to the Discovery Doc Podcast. I'm here with your host, Dr. Cece, functional medicine nurse practitioner, self-proclaimed toxin tamer, and crunchy mama, and my co-host. I'm Anna Kate, your medical mystery overachiever and discovery liaison. And today we're going to continue our conversation on this episode about the gut biome. Biodome. Yes. I'm Kate. Okay. Yeah, my show sure. she was like, I need to watch that movie. That seems hilarious. And that is an exact representation of what we were talking about. So if you go back to 1996 and you remember watching that movie, then that's exactly what happens is when you let things in that aren't supposed to be there, create chaos. And they will. Did you just say this? She showed me the trailer like 10 minutes ago. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to watch this movie. It looks so good. I love it. It's good. Um, But yeah, we, we talked quite a lot about the gut microbiome, the basics, what it is, what it does. So if you didn't, I would really encourage you guys to go back and listen to that episode because our whole month this month is about gut health and it's really going to build off of those basics. So we want you guys, when these experts come on and we have these more in-depth conversations, we want you guys to understand the basics so then you can better understand what they're talking about. Right. Yes. Yeah. And also if your littles come up to you and tell you that they have a tummy ache and they don't hold right here, right under their ribs, their stomach doesn't hurt. If they're holding down here in their intestines, their, their gut hurts, their, yeah. their, their intestines hurt. And they're probably, yes. And there's a big difference there. Yeah. But so, so setting kind of those baseline or basics with the gut microbiome last episode, now I want to venture a little bit further into what issues can be caused from an issue within your gut microbiome or what diseases or things like that, that are correlated with um, a gut microbiome that isn't as optimal as it should be. And there is quite a laundry list. And are these acute or chronic or both? Both. Yes. They can absolutely be both because, well, I'll answer that question a little bit, but They can absolutely be both because if you take something like the first one, which is infections, infections are these bad guys, these invasive pathogens that kind of either temporarily or on the chronic side cause issues within the gut lining. And that's where then we get symptoms from. So they can cause things like acute diarrhea, but it can also cause things like chronic inflammation. And so because, and Additionally, on terms of the chronic side, more of like the toxic damage to your gut lining, which then leads to Crohn's and all of that. IBS, IBD, all of that. Um, Some types of those pathogens even kind of invade your gut barrier, threatening to escape more so into the bloodstream, causing more of a systemic issue. And your blood doesn't really like to have junk in it. No, it does not. And all of that dysbiosis leads to a weakening of your gut's defenses where most of our immune system lives. So then we have weakened defenses, those pathogens are there, and now they're just overgrowing and breeding. And to your point, yes, like Crohn's, IBS, IBD, which I'll touch on a little bit more before or a little bit, but all of those, when I have those patients come to me, oh, Every single one of them, I find some sort of infection somewhere. And it's about the route. You mm-hmm. have to look at different routes. So I'm going to stop there because I'm not going on. I'm not going down a rabbit hole until my notes tell me to go down that rabbit hole. Okay. We have a lot. Again, this is going to be information and description heavy, yeah. definition heavy, yes. um, just so that you understand 
all of the things that we talk about when our experts come on and we do those interviews. So you have a baseline to know, oh, I know what this means. I know what symbiosis and dysbiosis. I know what uh, CNA is or, or CNS. Yeah. I was C- like, what's CNA? I don't know. CNS. <laughs> so all of those, yeah, all those things. Uh, central nervous attitude. We're going to stay positive. Hey, there we go. Wow, that was quick. You're one of those people that did you ever play? Did you guys have to do theater in high school Mm -hmm. and you like pass the ball to someone and you have to come up with like a quick fact? You're one of those people that can do that. Oh, if you're on, if you play trivia or um, monikers or a game where there's, you have to think like that, I need to be on your team. That is is my G. You put it my jam. Okay, let's say that it's like, okay, Anna Kate has the ball and she's throwing it to Cece. And CC has to name an animal that starts with C and she throws it at me and I have 30 seconds. I'll be like, um, um, kangaroo. Nope. That's okay. Um, um, cheetah, chameleon. Well, chameleon is not an animal. It's a reptile. I do that. And I panic and then I throw it back. And then in my head, I'm like, oh, all the things. Yep. This is the most easy one. Cat. That's me. You're like cat, cheetah. If my brain, if my Swiss cheese brain is firing on all cylinders, if yeah. it's not, there are things that I cannot remember for the life of me. So it's, it goes, but it goes both ways. It's both but ways. I like playing games. We like game night. Another, so do we, another big one that people kind of obsess about is SIBO, SIBO. Everyone pronounces it differently, but small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Basically it's dysbiosis. It's a fancy word for dysbiosis. A bad bacteria outweighs the good bacteria. It means that certain types of bad bacteria are overgrown and they're using too many resources that your good bacteria should be using. Mm-hmm. And they're producing too many children, too many byproducts that are then toxic towards your immune system or towards your gut lining. Um, and they settle where, where they shouldn't belong. So that's a big one that can cause chronic symptoms for sure and not acute symptoms. Another one is IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. IBD is basically there's like this little brain king, which is IBD. Mm -hmm. And that's a collection of different autoimmune conditions that includes things like ulcerative colitis, microscopic colitis, Crohn's, et cetera. So what's the difference between, because I've heard IBD, I've also heard IBS. Are they the same thing or are they different? Oh. Controversial statement coming. Both are dumb diagnoses. I'm sorry. They're dumb. So IBD is inflammatory bowel disease, which means that you have shown these symptoms over a chronic period of time of inflammation within your bowels. IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is like, oh, it's more of an acute thing that's we're not labeling as quite a chronic thing yet but you still have the inflammatory markers and you still have lots of diarrhea. It just kind of comes and goes. Both are names of symptoms. That's how I feel. Okay. And yeah. So syndrome is not actually a thing. It's a precursor to one of like ulcerative ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis is very different. Ulcerative colitis are, is where you have had some of these symptoms like the chronic diarrhea or inflammation, et cetera. And over time, that's created ulcers. Okay. Yes. Within your GI tract. A lot of those people will also suffer from pretty intense um, acid reflux. Okay. So contributes to those ulcerations. Okay. So honestly, they all come together because they are rooted in an inflammatory response within your gut. Yeah. And so hold that thought. Last one, because I think this is, well, not last one. There's so many, but another big one that I just want to touch on is something like arthrosclerosis, because this is, I think, less known about how the GI tract can impact our heart health or our vascular system. And the less certain kind of less desirable, I feel bad calling them less desirable, less desirable microbes. We don't want, we, we, yeah, we don't want any of the bad, any of the bad ones. Yeah really greatly increase your cardiovascular risk by producing something called TMAO. And that can, that TMAO can build up. Do not ask me to say that word. I'm not doing it. Go ahead. Can I say it? Yes. Trimethylene, trimethylamine, lamine, triethylamine. Trimethylamine and oxide. 
I just didn't want to put on the spot and had to say it because I don't like big words. Okay. Everyone knows this about me. I like big words because I say them wrong and I, I make up other, I other like words. I say them wrong, but I just don't like this. Give me the acronym. I'm fine with that. TMAO. Okay. But that byproduct is kind of a toxic byproduct and it builds up in your arteries that contributes then to the hardening of those arteries. So That's it's a hardening of the arteries, not a plat buildup. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. There's a difference. There is a difference. But even so, that increases your risk of certain cardiovascular events, right? So I think that's a huge one because not, I think when you think about gut health, not a lot of people think about hardening of your arteries. Yeah, I wouldn't. Right? Yeah. Do you? I do, but I'm a nerd. Um, other other conditions that, that I find that can be directly related or that just in literature are directly correlated are in, correlated with gut dysbiosis, I should say are things like allergies, eczema, asthma, anxiety, depression, different mood disorders, chronic fatigue, um, fatty liver, which go back and listen to our first episode. It kind of explains why that would occur with the relationship with, between the gut and, and the liver. Neurodegenerative diseases, that's a big one. Things like MS, um, rheumatoid arthritis, more autoimmune conditions, and several types of cancer. So that I, I want to say that and kind of keep it there for a second because that's a ton uh, of chronic yeah. issues. And it's not to say that our gut is the only contributing factor, but it can be a massive contributing factor that I feel is often overlooked, especially in conventional medicine, is if you have a neurodegenerative disease, let's say, you're not going to a GI doctor, mm -mm. they're keeping you within their realm. And so like, again, all the systems are just separated in conventional and, medicine. And they shouldn't be. And that's when misdiagnosis happens. So I have another friend of mine that has um, Lyme and they didn't, he, his doctor didn't know that he had Lyme and thought he had Crohn's because he had all the Lyme symptoms of messed up GI. So they removed all the Crohn's symptoms. Crohn's symptoms. They removed part of his colon mm -hmm. didn't have to mm -hmm. because he didn't have Crohn's. Mm -hmm. He had that Borrelia bur burgdorferi, he had burgers and fries. Oh, so he went through all of this mess, like, and he and I are sharing war stories and doing all the things. And again, he was on antibiotics for mm -hmm. tearing up his gut of what he had left and just all of the things. So, but they're thriving now. They just had a baby, got married, had a baby. That's true. So, um, yeah, it, but again, why it is so important to look at the body as a whole system yes. that they could have saved one, a surge a surgery, surgery, right. Yeah. And now he has not, he has, he's missing part of his colon. We don't need to take body parts if they don't need to be taken. It drives me crazy. Gallbladders are taken all the time for no reason. And then you're left with somebody who can't digest salad for the rest of their mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Their foods. Can you get rid of that good bile? It's just body parts are taken too easily. Y'all. Yeah. So really if nice. you're in a space where you are experiencing some of these symptoms or the list of things that we've talked about, reach out to perfect functional medicine office and get in to see her or your local functional yes. medicine doctor, get someone to look at the entire picture. And if they look at the entire picture and they don't put the puzzle pieces together to fix it, then okay. At least you tried, but you're going to get more information yeah. having someone look at everything and how yes. it affects and is tied together. And understanding your body. I get so many people to me when I run like very, what I consider very minimal lab core or just labs in general, patients will sit there and be like, wow, I've never seen this about myself. I've never seen this information. So even if it's just for the fact of understanding your body at a deeper level and what's going on with your body, because we, I mean, conventional medicine labs are saved for a problem, but why, why not use them to see what your body is actually doing and mm -hmm. where it's thriving and where it's doing great. And Anna Case talked about this in the past, but also having your baseline and understanding in the future, if that baseline is changing, well, now, you know, right. You know, it's not, you're not like, oh, well, I've never seen that before. So I have no idea what that is, bro. It's your body. Yeah. It's your, <laughs> your numbers and the, and the trajectory and history of your numbers is far more important yeah. than what they are 
um, comparing you to the reference the, range. Yeah, the, that's the words. I knew this, this guy. Yeah, the yeah this, this guy. Yeah. And then also, you know, putting it back in your binder. Like, I hope nobody has a binder. I do too. Like me. Yes. But <laughs> you should have a binder for everybody in your family of things that come because it is so hard to remember, especially if someone turns chronic for whatever reason, that uh, this is the year that this happened. This is the doctor that we saw. This is the event that happened or occurred. Um, but also just pr for prevention, there doesn't right. need to be a problem, but why not use these laboratories as a means to prevent yourself from getting somewhere? And you would only know that if you had the information. And so it drives me crazy when patients are like, I, and again, it's very basic stuff to me, but my very basic is much more comprehensive than somebody else's. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, we should know this about our bodies. Like this should be information that we see. You right. know, maybe just on a yearly basis or something. Right. And even in our, in episode 22, we talked about cholesterol and mm -hmm. HDL and LDL. So if you're one that wants to track that, that's a good one to have run every year at, I mean, I'm sure that there's a specific time that. Yeah, I do it fasting in the morning. Yeah, it's beneficial to do that. So, and then that's your number. So do you really have high cholesterol or is your HDL and LDL at a great ratio and yours just tends to track at a different percentage? Like, yeah. If you don't know that, uh, allopathic doctors are going to say, here's a statin and take this drug and bye. That doesn't fix the, doesn't fix the problem. And there may not even be a problem to fix. Right. So exactly. I digest. We do this all the time. We have our notes and we sway. Hey, it's real. It what? is real. Okay. So. What can we do? What can we do? Yes. We don't want to become fearful of everything that I just named, but do know that if you struggle or your child struggles for anything that we did name that there could definitely be a gut component to it that could relieve some of the symptoms or that could kind of put those symptoms on hold for good. So yes, what can we do? I think that the biggest factor here, the most important factor is that your microbiome is like a fingerprint. It's unique to you and only you. And we inherit kind of our first microbes, remember those good bacteria, during actually, if, if our mom gave birth to us vaginally, mm -hmm. that's our first introduction to the good microbes. Because we're covered in meconium. And the vaginal canal. Yes. Like when you go through the vaginal canal, the vaginal canal has good gut or good microbes yep. in there. Just like we talked about the poop. It takes enough time and it exactly. deposits and collects things along the way. So sorry, that baby sorry, collects. Face. That's okay. Um, so baby collects them. So that's why when, you know, there's research between C-section babies and vaginal mm -hmm. first that those C-section babies aren't exposed to that good, those good microbes right off the bat, which is okay. C-sections are needed sometimes. Um, but it's just, it's just a fact for the health of baby and mom and survival rate of baby exactly. and mom. It's important. The second, um, kind of place where we get exposed to it is through breastfeeding. Some women obviously can't breastfeed, but the ones who can are blessed and fortunate too. That is giving baby all those good microbes and helping to build up the baby's immune defenses by producing those microbes, transmitting them over and helping to develop the gut microbiome of the baby. The first, and then, and then later in life, obviously like environmental toxins or just environments in general, or what we eat then alters the microbiome. So that's why everyone is so different. Everyone's is so unique is we don't all eat the same. We aren't all exposed to the same things. We all aren't born the same way. Right. And we all aren't even like, if you go to supplements, we all aren't given the same supplements. So everyone's looks very, very different, which is a big fact. And the things that we're exposed to can either benefit mm -hmm. that microbiome or be harmful to a microbiome. The, I said this in our last episode, but again, just crucial. The first two to three years of life, is the most critical for developing your gut microbiome for life. Because by two to three years of age, that kid has developed the microbiome that they are going to continue on through adulthood with. Think about that. Very cool. Yeah. Think about that. They, they have gradually developed towards an adult microbiota by three years of age crazy. That means that within those first two to three years of life, it is critical to focus on gut health to set this child up for success throughout their entire life. 
So it's not only for moms that breastfeed, because I know you breastfeed, mm -hmm. that it is the diversity and microbiome and gut biome of your diet mm -hmm. because you're creating food yeah. for baby because, so here's a question. How long do you breastfeed like until they start getting teeth, milk? I mean, every baby's yeah. different. Every mom's different. Like it was just, it's just a question so for me. In a perfect world and no judgment here because I did not make it this long. In a perfect world, because that gut microbiome is developing until two to three, mm -hmm. we would be breastfeeding until two to three. And maybe not every meal, but have it part of yes. the process. So you're introduced when they get because their they're teeth. they're eating food by that point. Right. Yeah. Okay. So they're in terms of liquid consumption. Okay. That would be optimal. Now there are some women out there who are amazing and can do it. And that's um, impeccable. I think with Jada, I got to maybe like 14 months. And it just, it was my time. I just yeah. felt it, you know, it was my time to stop other moms. It's two months, you know, but in a perfect world, if we're talking about just how breastfeeding impacts the gut microbiome, yeah, it would be for that full two to three years so that you are supporting the gut microbiome. Now, if we can't then, and this is good, good segue. If we, if we can't, or just for extra support, that is why around six months or so, six to 12 months, depending on the patient, depending on the, their history, depending on what they're going through, I always recommend bringing in something like mega IgG mm -hmm. because mega, especially if um, moms are unable to breastfeed or don't want to breastfeed again, never any judgment there. Then I will come in at a safe time and say, okay, we aren't getting those good immunoglobulins from mom, which is helping to boost up the immune system, but also helping to develop that gut diversity. Mm -hmm. So let's take a very safe supplement and let's implement that. And for some kiddos, it's around six months. For some kiddos, it's around a year. Um, but mega IgG, I like them by microbiome labs. I use them quite a, a bit because people get the words colostrum and immunoglobulins mixed up. Yeah, those are two different. Ones. They're two different things. So colostrum is the gooey goodness that comes from mom's breast milk. Mm -hmm. And that is rich with something called immunoglobulins. And when you go to supplement with colostrum, it has dairy components, right? Because we can't take a human, like human breast milk and take the immunoglobulins from it and then give it in a supplement form. Um, so they often drive it from cow, from bovine serum or cow blood. And when they do that, a lot of these companies, they leave the dairy component, which gives us colostrum. Well, in my patient population, I'm not messing with a chance that this baby has a dairy. dairy yes, because yeah. <laughs> like, most of us do. So I would rather go to a company that does not contain any traces of dairy. And that's just the only reason why I, I use micro or my guide GG by microbiome labs, because it's that highly concentrated immunoglobulin without the dairy component that supports the baby's immunity, also supports the gut diversity and gut health, um, and helps to kind of balance the teeter-totter between giving the baby good things and protecting it against yuckies. So how do we, what's the me delivery method Oh, for a six month old? <laughs> so it's a powder. And if mom is breastfeeding and baby has not taken a bottle, then you just need, I mean, like a little bit amount, like there's a scooper that comes with it. And you, it could be a fifth of that scooper. And so if baby hasn't had a bottle, there's two ways to one, you can take a little syringe and express a little bit, bit of breast milk mm -hmm. and then fill it up with a syringe. I mean, like a milliliter, it doesn't have to be anything big and then mix a little bit of that powder, shake up the syringe, squirt in baby's mouth. The two is some women just put the powder right on their nipple yeah. and then latch the baby on. Obviously, if they're taking a bottle, if they're not if they're, if let's say you're pumping milk and putting it in a bottle or if they're formula fed and you just put it in their bottle once a day and it dissolves, easy, easy. shake it up, give it super easy. Awesome. Yeah. It's really, really great stuff. Um, and the other thing to start around that age is a good probiotic. Yeah. Helping to, you know, diversify and enrich and, uh, you know, water our garden. That yeah. Talked about. Yeah. <laughs> and I always educate patients on the rotation through that and certain ones. So in infancy, there's a couple and I have no disclaimer. I have no relationships with any of these. So this is just literally what I recommend. Um, but there's some good ones for infants that are powders. There's probiota infant by seeking health. 
There is Therabiotic Infant by Claire Labs. There is, um, ooh, well, BioRay, I'd save BioRay for a little bit later, like around 12 months. There's BioRay has a MDF tummy. I think it's what it's called. That's liquid, but I'd like to save that for a little bit later around 12 months. Um, there's a bunch of good ones. That smidge, smidge has an infant one. Um, and so just rotate, just rotate through those, you know, pick one per month and rotate through. And the other thing is as kids start to, and this is assuming we can from the start, right? And there's always time to make these adjustments later on if we haven't, but from the start, if you're about to have yeah. a baby, listen up yeah. <laughs> because it's just much easier to do this from the get go. Did you take probiotics as a kid? I know your mom was. No. Yeah. My, no. my mom was taking um, barley greens. So mm -hmm. she's been on, she's been on, she's take, been taking her greens forever. <laughs> and she would give us the powder. Like when we were in like middle school and high school, we hated doing it, but we did it because she told us to, but we never took probiotics as little kids. Yeah. Like, no. I don't remember. But to be, and my mom says this all the time. She's like, you didn't do all this when you were a kid, but my defense to that or argument to that is that when, if we are talking about 30 years ago, do you know how much more rich the soil was in nutrients? Yeah. Do you know how much more rich our food was in nutrients? Oh, yeah. You have to eat 30 oranges to get the same vitamin C content of one orange 150 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. So that is massive. Also, things that, like there were no genetically modified foods 30 right. years ago you know what i mean so right. it's it's apples and oranges to compare um then versus now it really is but something else that we focused on with our kids um and that's really really important for just future gut health is diversity in the diet from the start from the absolute start we tend to be creatures of habit and we go to grab the same foods over and over and over again mm -hmm. and that's what the convenience of grocery stores has given us you can get foods all year round no matter what and that then when we eat the same food over and over and over again it increases our likelihood of things like food sensitivities mm -hmm. and food allergies we're not meant and designed to eat the same food over and over and over again we're meant and designed to eat what is in season yeah so that's another reason i love to go to local farmers markets and support local just shops in terms of produce because they only have what's being grown what's right now. Grown. Yeah. And right. it forces you to kind of rotate through things and you can still have a routine because I know as busy parents or busy working humans, even if you don't have kids and, and you work and you're on the go, then for yourself, you can still have a routine within your week, but diversify it. So you can have the same breakfast Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, you know, and then have a different breakfast, Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday, mm -hmm. like you can still kind of routine it like that, where you're not as overwhelmed by choosing different things every single day. But how we kind of do it is by grocery shopping. So we have to go to the store. <laughs> I don't want to say how many times in a week. We probably go to the store three times a week. But you buy lots of fresh stuff yes. as well. So you yes. eat it and then it doesn't go to waste. Yeah. So when it gets replenished, you can go buy fresh yeah. stuff again. So and that's there's, okay. There's five of us. So it goes fast. Um, but what we do, we do one bigger trip and then two, like, oh, we're out of this, this, and this mm -hmm. trips throughout the week. But what I do is I'm intentional on what I'm buying so that when I get home, I don't have to think about it. So we, I do that with fruit. For example, let's say that my big shopping trip on Monday, we get bananas, strawberries, and plums. Okay, cool. Then the next time I go and get fruit, I'm getting something else, blackberries, blueberries, and apples, you know, and I diversify it that way. And I do the same thing with vegetables. I do the same thing with kids snacks. I do the same thing with what my kids have as their morning drink, because then it is creating a diversity amongst my kids to be just open mm -hmm. to trying new foods. And then it takes the, the guesswork out for everybody in the family where, okay, this is what we have in our fridge. This mm -hmm. is what we have in our pantry. We don't have to think about, oh, wait, have I had, you know, this same breakfast every single day this week? Do I need to change it? You're forced to change it. Right. You know, right. and you have really good eaters. We have very good eaters, but I will say it's because from the get go, they were eating like pro athletes. Right. Like my husband was always in training camp 
And so at, you know, nine months old, they're eating sweet potatoes and avocado and scrambled eggs. And we just never stop that. Right. And so their palates are geared towards really nutrient dense foods. Mm -hmm. They will, they don't reject anything. They don't, they will, will be willing to try everything. And even as like Ava's gotten older and she's surrounded by people, you know, more candy and things like that, she's still making really good decisions. Right. And we still let her have those things every once in a while, but she doesn't go towards like, she's not someone who's going to crave or reject or um, like deny or fight us on eating healthier foods because we started that. Right. That was our rule as, as a household. Um, but the point being there is if you diversify what they're exposed to from the get go, mm -hmm. you're diversifying their gut microbiome and you're helping to set up not only their food habits and their eating habits, but also their GI tract right. for success in the future. Right. And it's never too late. If that's something you guys can work on that at any point in life, yeah. you know, food diversity. Um, we do the same thing with, with our protein sources. We go, we cycle through chicken and turkey and salmon and mahi mahi and even just like plant-based like chickpeas and things mm -hmm. like that we cycle through and we and uh red meat as well mm -hmm. and it's just once you get used to it it's fine yeah it's easy well it's just like we talked about on our halloween episode of real candy tastes better than the highly processed stuff because mm -hmm. the highly processed stuff tastes like plastic if you've gone from to a more natural and reducing all of those toxins and, and over consumption, then they just taste different. So the same yeah, thing with, totally tastes different. you know, with all of this and also with having your kids have different choices and them being really good eaters, they're deciding of whether they're hungry or if they just want the junk, because if it's just junk food that they won't eat anything else, they're not really hungry. Right. Exactly. Like and if you're really hungry, you'll eat you'll eat more salad or you'll yeah. eat more fruit or whatever it is. But if that's the only option, so that may be kind of a new thing to, to introduce if you want to diversify right? and just get them involved. Hey, right. we're going to go to the grocery store and we're going to pick an orange vegetable. What yeah. orange vegetable do you want? And then the next week you do a green. So eat the rainbow, mm -hmm. not, not a bag of Skittles. You can get giggles, but, <laughs> but go through and get them involved and say, Hey, let's find a recipe because they're they want to do it and they want to learn the stuff and they're more likely involved and want to try things if they've had um had all the things involved right exactly and another good point there is to from the get go helping children understand that food is a nutrient yes and that's that kind of is if you break down why food diversity is so important, it's because those nutrients, what we talked about last episode is that the different microbes in your GI tract, they need different nutrients to thrive. Mm -hmm. And so if we're constantly just feeding one side and not, you know, shutting light or watering the other side, then we're going to create an imbalance. And so for our kids, what I did and continue to do is I... I ask questions. I say, okay, who knows what carrots are good for? Who knows what broccoli is good for? Who knows what sweet potatoes are good for? And it makes them really excited to know the answer or to guess the answer. But then it also teaches them that, hey, we are consuming this for a purpose and it's not strictly for pleasure. Right. Obviously they have foods that are strictly for pleasure. Their entire treat box <laughs> is for pleasure. They get that too. But I want them to know that Throughout the day, the bulk of what we are eating is for a purpose. And society right. today has completely lost that mentality. It is a pleasure, just absolutely like on the go society when it comes to food, instead of viewing food as a necessity to fuel your body with the appropriate nutrients. Right. If you're going to be if you're after that convenience, at least be crunchy convenient. Mm -hmm. So that's something that she and I both share. Uh, we want to make the best choices possible. And maybe that's prepping at home when we're going to go out and there's games or we're going to be go like on a road trip or whatever it is, bring the snacks that are good for you. So like I went on a road trip recently and I had my gluten-free pretzels yeah. and I had cheese and I had my Archer um, stick. Stiff. Like, and then the um, it's just fruit. The bars. Yeah, that's yeah. all. That I think well, that's all. That's it. That's it. I yeah. That's it. 
yeah. So I had something sweet, so I didn't have to stop and you know, because on the road or when you're traveling, you kind of want to have junk food. Oh yeah, and you get but, super hungry and over hungry, and then you stop, you know, at a gas station, and then you can't find anything. And so we do the same thing. We bring all, I mean, grocery bags worth of snacks. Yes. And then we stop for little like walk breaks or play breaks or whatever, but we have all the food that we need. We even make sandwiches yeah. at a time and it just, it works out. And now a word from our sponsor. Most people don't realize the connection between the immune and digestive systems. In fact, 70 to 80% of your immune system lives in your gut. That's why it's so important to protect yourself daily. Stellar Biotics are pioneers in immune and gut health with 20 plus years of science behind their metabiotic and probiotic supplements. They are all natural, proven safe and effective for everyone in your family, children, nursing mothers, and even pets. I trust them for my family's immune and gut health support, and I hope you consider them for your family too. Learn more at StellarBiotics.com and use coupon code DRCC10 to get 10% off your purchase today. The other thing that is, and you started talking about this last episode, and I was like, hold your horses. We're not talking about Whoa, this. Whoa, right Della. Now. Yes. Are something else that we can be very protective of with kids, but also with adults in general, is avoiding antibiotic overuse. Oh, that bubblegum antibiotic when we were little? Dude, my mom had to like hide it because I would want to go in and take an extra dose because yes. it tastes so good. It tastes so good. But if we take, for example, Let's take ear infections for kids. When it comes to kids, acute ear infections are the most likely cause that your kid will get or receive in antibiotics. But 80%, 80, 80%, 80% of ear infections in kids would resolve without antibiotics. So that means out of all those kids who are getting the antibiotics, only really 20% need antibiotics to recover. Think about that. Think about it. So again, if antibiotics are truly needed for a kid or for an adult, for you, yes, they can be life-saving. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm nothing against them in that sense whatsoever. They are just so misused and overused. And that is destroying your good, healthy microbiome. Right. And for someone like Anna Kane over here, who was put on doxycycline for months and months and months and months at a time, you can imagine then what that did to her gut health Mm -hmm. specifically. So avoiding unnecessary antibiotic use is extremely important. And especially within those first two to three years of a kid's life, especially important then, because like we said, that is the most kind of dramatic and critical time period to developing and fostering and watering and feeding Mm -hmm. their microbiome. So what I always suggest is, and this is for anybody, no matter the age, is if an antibiotic is needed, we need absolutely need two things. We need to double up on our good bacteria. Mm -hmm. So our good probiotics, you can take your normal kind of whatever you take on a daily basis. Some of those we mentioned for kids earlier are totally fine in the morning or for infants in the morning. And then you really want a spore based one at night. Okay. So we talked earlier about Saccharomyces boulardii, kind of that stronger and it, it withstands the acidity of the stomach gets to the small intestine where it releases more of those endotoxins. We want something a little bit stronger at night for a kid. This might be like a fourth of a capsule for an adult. Take that whole thing. If you know, antibiotics are coming up in your future. You start taking that and prepping your gut like a week before. Okay. Most of us don't know, right? Most of it's like an acute thing where all of a sudden you're on antibiotic. Start while you're on that antibiotic and continue. I like, I I tell my patients at least two weeks in a perfect world, I would like four weeks after, depending on the length of time that you had to take that antibiotic. Okay. So keep going afterwards. That is doing two things. It's helping to replenish the good. And then the second my Cisbilardi is helping to keep the bad guys at bay. The other side is candida. You, you mentioned this earlier. Oh, candida, candida and I go way backward. Yes. Candida is a fungi, fungus. He's not really fun. He's not fun. And he overgrows when he's given opportunity. I always do this. And I say this to patients. It's always a guy. I'm so sexist when it comes to 
GI issues. Like literally when I'm going through a GI map with a patient, I'm like, okay, he is doing this. And you know, these guys and I have to yeah. stop myself and be like, I'm sorry. So there's, there's no path. Right. Well, it's because it's a fun, it's a fungus. It's a fungi. It's a fungi. So exactly. that's where the guy part comes from. It's we're not, yeah. uh, whatever it's orientation is, we just don't want it. It's no fun. Yes. So, so that like candida is something that we can have a baseline of and it can be chilling and be just fine. But when it's given opportunity and it can overgrow, now we can have, even within the GI tract, we can have increased bloating. We can have increased reactivities to food. We can have constipation. If it becomes more systemic, we can have headaches, migraines, mm -hmm. fatigue, joint pain, just from candida becoming more systemic, coming out of the, of the gut and into the blood. Right. So when we're given antibiotics and we suppress the good bacteria, we're allowing anything that's opportunistic or any of those bad guys a chance to overgrow. Right. Candida is one of the big ones there. And so I always like, if you're on antibiotics, adult or kid, I always like to throw in something for candida to help keep it at mm -hmm. bay. This can be as conventional, even though I would compound it. I never get nystatin from a normal pharmacy. I'm not going to say why, but I, compounding is just clean. There's yep. no added ingredients. It's a fatty acid in nystatin and that's it. Um, we can, take that night yeah. with the other with. So you don't, you actually don't want to take it with Saccharomyces boulardii. Good you to know. It, yeah. You want to take it away from Saccharomyces boulardii because they kind of fight. They kind of eat each other. So take it in the morning with your other probiotic. Okay. Um, so it can be compounded nystatin, or if you want to stay very natural instead, it can be things like oil of oregano, MCT oil, mm -hmm. caprylic acid. Any of those are awesome natural antifungals right. that help to keep candida more at bay. So those are my rules for if someone is absolutely, absolutely needs to go on an antibiotic. Right. And you'll always have candida. Like that's a normal, yeah. that's a normal thing that lives in your body. It's not, you're not going to eliminate it forever. We just don't want the overgrowth because exactly. the overgrowth causes problems. Exactly. It's one we need it's beneficial when it's doing its thing at a, certain in, level. at a certain level, if it gets over, overgrown. And that's when you crave sugars and yes. cause usually when you're sick, what are you doing? You're laying on the couch, resting and recovering and eating a bunch of junk food. <laughs> Even if it's, even if it's healthy junk food, it's typically higher in sugar sometimes. Mm -hmm. So feeding that candy eaters. Yeah. That's what I call them. Um, candy eaters. Candy eaters. Oh my gosh. That was good. Um, the other thing is, you know, just to be realistic. We are exposed to things all the time throughout life. We're exposed to things. So for kids, it depends on the age. So take this with a grain of salt. Um, this is not medical advice, but with adults or just me personally, I like to go through things like a little candida or parasite work. I'm not going to call it a true cleanse. I think that word gets overused and those can be extremely harsh on the body sometimes if not done right and done at the appropriate time. It can actually make us feel worse sometimes. So I like to say a little candida or parasitic work mm -hmm. maybe a couple times per year. If you're overall healthy, have no chronic issues, just to maintain your gut microbiome and maintain the beneficial aspect of it. And anything that might be kind of overgrowing or overbreeding, we're telling it to sit down. So this can be in terms of something like candida, it can be something as simple as a good binding agent. Yep. I personally like to use GI detox plus, um, but that's a combination of ingredients that some people don't do well with. So you can do just activated charcoal or bennonite clay or zeolite clay, something like that. Um, to help kind of group up or bind up those fung fungi balls. But, yes, those fungi. And then you poop them out, you excrete yep. them more easily, or you sweat them out or urinate them out more easily. Um, in addition to that, some good kind of natural agents alongside the, the binding agent are your oil of oregano, berberine, um, caprylate is really good. Powdarco is really good. Rosemary leaf. There's certain products out there that combine all of those, mm -hmm. um, that you can grab even from sprouts or, or, you know, your local supplement store Yeah, that you take those two for a good month and you tell that bad boy to sit down. Yeah. And we want them to get, we want the body to release those from where they shouldn't be. And then with binding agent, 
rip them all up, last, put a lasso around them and get them out of the body. Because otherwise, if you just release them and don't have that binding agent, yeah. then they get reabsorbed and yeah. we don't do anything with them. So we've wasted yeah. the release protocol on not having the binders to round them up and, and the, the release, paddy wagon to get them out of town. Yeah, and the release of it can also cause more symptoms. So if you're releasing them into right. the bloodstream and not getting them out, now you have an uptick in certain symptoms that you didn't have before because you pissed off the, the fungi, mm -hmm. you made him mad, and you're not excreting him. Would that be a Herxheimer reaction? Yeah, because a Herxheimer reaction is just when your immune system recognizes something that it needs to go fight and something that's foreign. And our immune system pays attention to that and it goes, oh, what is going on over there? I have to intervene. So uh, now I'm going to intervene. And now my good immune system is attacking those little fungal balls. And now we become symptomatic from that interaction. And we don't want our body to hurt. Mm -hmm. I know a big thing, especially several years ago, going through all the Lyme, we wanted to get the Lyme out and do the things. And so it was almost encouraged in the community that Herx makes you feel better, but don't. It's not a thing. Like, yeah. don't, don't, don't just. It just means that you're pushing your body too far too than far. it's ready to go. And right. that's really important. And that's why I said earlier, like those parasitic cleanses or candida cleanses, sometimes they aren't appropriate for people because it's too much information coming in and your body can't process it fast enough to get out. And now we have those Herxheimer reactions or we, we feel worse. And it's your body. That's information your body's telling you that, hey, slow down. I'm not ready. I need to build back up. Right. And that overload. And I, I remember feeling that too, where like I would go on this herbal protocol back before I did SOT for Lyme and I felt terrible, but I was like, oh, this means it's working. Like it's getting things out. So I just need to chug through. And no, yeah. it did absolutely nothing because my body was not ready to receive that information. Right. It's too much. Um, for parasites, I actually like a different binding agent. I really like Mimosa Pudica. It helps to bind parasites a little bit better than like activated charcoal benonite clay. Do not, whatever you want to say, don't say it. It's not the mimosa that I'm thinking of. It's not. No, it's all the fun mimosas that I can't have currently. Um, but I like mimosa pudica and anything like natural agents. When we talk about natural agents with parasites, we like herbal extracts that have things like black walnut and wormwood and olive leaf and fennel seed and clove and all of that. Those herbal extracts are very, very strong. Mm -hmm. So just caution with that as well. For kids, it could look like just some good biocidin that's a full spectrum liquid for a month if they're healthy. If they're healthy. Um, that's a great natural kind of anti-parasitic and, and anti-fungal um, GI specific herbal extract that's really gentle. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on is like certain things that I think get overlooked. Like we touched on a, a few of um, disorders or diseases or symptoms that can be impacted by your gut health. And there's a few of them that drive me crazy that I want to touch on a little bit more. Yeah. Um, one is just if your kid is chronically constipated because I had, get this. Backed up or too much? Backed up. Okay. Yeah, backed up. Well, for right now, backed up. Um, I just had a friend tell me this story about her three-year-old niece who suffers from um, a genetic condition, but also chronic constipation at three years old. Okay, chronically constipated. To the point where this poor mm -hmm. baby has was just in the ER and they had to admit her because she was so constipated. And the the mom followed up with the pediatrician after that mm -hmm. hospital admission. And the you know what the pediatrician said? Do you know what the pediatrician said? She said to Google how common it is for three-year-olds to be constipated. Why is the pediatrician? What? Don't think she should see that pediatrician. Anymore. And then she was given Miralax for six months. Okay. I have so many issues here. I have so many issues here. Okay. Adults should not be taking Miralax. Period. Yeah. I'm just going to say, if you, okay. So here's the thing with those types of things. If you tell your body, if you take something to tell your body to loosen up and, and do things, then your body 
doesn't learn how to do it. Exactly. And then that creates an even bigger problem because, oh, well, if mom's just going to do my homework for me, I don't have to learn anything. You get lazy. Your, your body gets lazy. Your body unlearns how to move yes. things through your system. So just, that's all I'm going to say on that one. Not to mention, and that's with adults, not to mention that if you look at the manufacturer's insert of Miralax, it actually says not intended for children and not intended for chronic use. It is intended for short-term use of constipation relief in adults. Mm -hmm. But raise your hand, listeners, if your kid was prescribed Miralax over five days, let's say. So many pediatricians just hand it out. Constipation? Okay, take it. Oh, they got off of it. They're still constipated? Okay, take some more of it. And now we have kids who are on Miralax for a year, two years. And there are current kind of lawsuits going on and things that say that Miralax should come with a black box warning for neuropsychiatric disorders, because there's so much evidence that chronic use in kids has been a contributing factor to neuropsychiatric disorders. That should not be a thing. Those words should not be in the same sentence. Right. It is. It is wild. It is absolutely wild. So if your kid is chronically constipated. Anna Kate just explained it so well that something like Miralax or a diuretic is just loosening up the poop to get it out easier, but it's not solving the underlying problem. That is not normal. It is not normal. I don't care if your pediatrician said, go to Google how common it is for kids to be constipated. It's not normal. It's not. It may be common, but it's not normal. So please seek additional help. There's always a reason why that kid is constipated. And honestly, it is one of the easiest things to figure out. Dehydration? If you just, definitely a common factor. If you just go to the right person who can give you the right tools, constipation is not hard. I had a, I had a patient, um, I think he was maybe two or three last year where he was so he was so constipated and had been on Miralax for so long that the pediatrician's next step was to actually go put a stent in his anus. In a three-year-old? Stent in his anus. I'm sorry, what? I worked with that kid for under four weeks and he was pooping normally. And it's not hard. Like it's just looking well, at the body a different way. And that drives me crazy. Right. It's not hard to figure out. So please see extra help. That is not, it is not normal. Um, the other thing that gets missed a lot is eczema. When we yes. have severe eczema, there is always a GI component. And if we think about G- our GI tract, Histamine can be within our GI tract at a a relatively high concentration, but even worse and even higher during inflammatory processes. So we have a kid with eczema, right? Let's say a kid with severe eczema. I would venture to say that 99% of the time there is a GI issue. So we have gut dysfunction and that gut dysfunction creates an inflammatory process more globally Mm -hmm. that we kind of talked a little bit about last time my last episode. And now there's an increase in that histamine release because the inflammation is higher. Right. So now when we have an increase of that histamine release, now we have increased reactivity to foods. Now we can't tolerate any foods. Now we're reacting to all these foods. If if new foods are being introduced and we have then increased eczema because there are always triggers to eczema, but they always relate back to that histamine level. Mm -hmm. So for eczema kids, I always start in the GI tract and kind of work my way out from there. Right. Because eczema is an outside marker for an internal storm. Yes. And if the storm has gotten so bad that now it's creating an issue on the skin, then there's a big dysfunction there. So it's right. And you were telling us about um, a baby that or a toddler that had really bad eczema and you just cleaned up there. I have a lot of eczema babies right now. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yes, it's always the starting point. It's one piece of the puzzle. I say that a lot. It's one piece of the puzzle, but it is a massive piece of the puzzle to clean up the GI tract in a kid or an adult with chronic eczema. Right. Cause an massive outside piece. topical 
ointment or lotion is not going to fix that problem until you fix what's in the gut. Exactly. And that's why parents, if you have a kid who has chronic eczema and you're giving them a steroid cream, it works for a little bit. But as soon as you stop using it, that eczema comes right on back. Why? Because it's an internal problem. And all you're doing is suppressing that outside problem. And then we take away that suppressive agent right. is back. So another one um, is pandas. You know what pandas is? Not the cute, fuzzy Asian bear oh. with the black and white. That's not that. Okay. No. So pandas is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infections. Hey, I'm a strep kid. Yeah. I don't, I don't need to be proud of So I'm, I'm mentioning this. Because pandas, I think in recent years has taken, it's much more known, which I'm very thankful for. But what that means is these kiddos or adults, we have adult pandas patients as well. I don't really call it pandas anyways, because again, that's just a name of strep going haywire. So yeah. just fix it. Yeah. Um, but what it looks like in kids, it's very cyclical. We, have, we can have this kid who's cool, calm, collected, and all of a sudden irritable, angry, I mean, throwing things, hitting mom, scratching mom, uncontrollable emotions, whether it's super, super heightened emotions or low, just emotional dysregulation to the finest. I tell adults this, we can have that same response. It just looks different in adults because we're, we're trained to suppress those emotions, right? right? We can hold it in a little bit better, but ultimately what that leads to also OCD, ticks, things like that are very common. The strep bacteria is not a bad bacteria per se. We come across it usually as kids, you know, that's normal. But these people who hold on to the memory of it or where it's overgrowing in the GI tract, it's an opportunistic infection with right. a GI tract. If it's overgrowing there and then it, it's overgrowing, so to speak, within the blood where our antibodies are now attacking it, thinking that this is a more chronic infection, that's where you get encephalitis, inflammation in the brain. And then that panda's diagnosis and all the emotional dysregulation that comes with it. So how often is this misdiagnosed as on the spectrum? Um, quite a bit. Yeah, okay. quite a bit. And it's very... It's, I think it's getting better um, because presentation wise is very, very different. Um, but I would say that pretty often, even still, okay. it's, there's getting mixed diagnoses there because pandas is very cyclical. You'll have a fully verbal kid who does well in school, who socializes well, who then goes from zero to 60. I mean, within the drop of a pin. Right. And that's because the strep is activated. Yes, exactly. And how is that different than strep B? Because I am, is that the same thing? Is that different? Different strain. Strep is a big family. Okay. Yeah. So I have strep. You have groupie strep. Group, group, oh, see, I don't even know. Groupie yeah. strep. So, because I would have strep throats as, as a kid and all of this stuff and as an antibody accumulator, mm -hmm. like what, how do I? How do, yes. how do I so navigate? There's, there's different ways that strep can become a problem. Okay. One is that strep, strep species within the GI tract can be fairly normal. We have a kind of a normal baseline of it, but if it's allowed to party and yeah. activate, now we have a strep overgrowth within the GI tract, which then can impact us more systemically. Okay. If you had recurrent tonsillitis, strep throat as a kid, now you can become what they call um, a carrier of that strep antibody. To me, that's not normal either because now we have a, an automatic, instead of going from the gut outward, we have an automatic immune response towards that bacteria and you create, you keep those antibodies, they stick around. And when those antibodies stick around more systemically and cross the blood brain barrier and enter like our, more of our central nervous system, right. now we can have those same kind of quote pandas symptoms in even adults from having recurrent tonsillitis as a kid. So sorry, we I, I I had to ask no, because I wanted to know because yeah. there's a difference because you hear strep and okay, it's a big family. Yeah. It can be 15 different things. Well, which one is it? Right. They're both very important. And here's why. If you are a strep quote carrier and, but you haven't had strep throat in 20 years, 
And those antibodies are just hanging out. Mm -hmm. They're not meant to just hang out. We can't become immune to strep. So that immune response should not be there anymore. If we have strep in the gut, that's partying. It shouldn't be partying. It should be sitting down nicely at a baseline where it's not causing an issue. So the question in both of those is why? What is allowing your immune system to take this relatively normal bacteria and activate it? and turn it on and have it cause a problem. Yeah. So even with my pandas kids, there it is not just ever the strep. There is something underlying that's allowing it to wake up. And that can come from within your gut. It can also come from more systemically with other viruses, other bacteria, other toxic agents, whatever it may be, that's brewing in there, that's activating these followers. Strep is a follower. And so... In terms of gut health specifically, what I look at with patients is, okay, why is it turned on? Mm -hmm. Why is it partying? Are there other pathogenic organisms in there that don't belong, that are there, that are turning the sky on? Or do I have to look in the blood? Right. So that that is important to know. Food for thought with anyone dealing with strep as a chronic problem. Or the symptoms and you don't know what it is and they right. get tested for strep, for right. pandas, for the, ask the questions. Yes, ask the questions. The other one, which we touched on a little bit earlier, Crohn's, IBD, IBS, they're all a result of chronic inflammation and they all have triggers. So I love when I have IBS, IBD, Crohn's patients come to me because the treatment is anti-inflammatories, right? To reduce the inflammation and steroids. Okay. Why? What do steroids do? Steroids suppress that immune response. So in conventional medicine, therefore, it's known that there is some sort of overactive immune response, but hey, let's throw a steroid at it to suppress it. And not figure out what their immune response, exactly. the immune system is responding to. Exactly. So why? I why don't they ask that question? I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand it because I do. And it's a big teller. It's a big teller. I have, I mean, I've had 20 year olds, 22 year olds with diagnosis of Crohn's who come to me who are on either Remicade or Humira, which are very intense drugs. And they're just told they have to be on those for the rest of their lives because it's suppressing that immune response. And I'll look at them and I'll ask, okay, so since starting that, the Humira, have you had a Crohn's kind of outbreak, so to speak? Flare. Or episode or flare. And they'll be like, you know, it's not a hundred percent better, but it's definitely a lot better. And so I'll look at them and say, okay, why do you think that is? And it's because whatever autoimmune reaction is occurring is being told to go to sleep. Okay, so I want to find what the actual autoimmune reaction, where that's stemming from. And that's just like, I don't get it. I don't get it why that's not a normal thought process. Because if we could fix the immune disruptor, we wouldn't have to put a Band-Aid on it that doesn't really actually fix the problem and all the side effects make it worse. And then we have a miserable person that doesn't exactly. know what their body's telling them because everything hurts. Yes. And there's always, always, always a trigger. So if you know somebody or have somebody who suffers from Crohn's, IBS, IBD, any of those, there is always a trigger, whether it's like we've said, fungus, viral, bacterial, maybe some sort of food, you know, intolerance that you don't even know that you have. And it's misdiagnosed because all those things can produce inflammation within the GI tract, right. but please know that there's always something that can be done always. And you can go from a place of being on that steroid long-term to kind of tapered off and not needing it. And, you know, to what I, what I tell my patients is realistically, we can kind of heal your GI tract up, find the problem, heal the GI, GI tract up. But if you go on vacation and you eat all the things that you haven't had in years that, you know, are triggers for you then you might have a flare. And then we have to kind of do some remediation and backtrack. But that is so much better of a place than having to rely on a drug for the rest of your life at right. 20 years old. Right. Right. So food for thought. Um, we, I think we'll get into a lot more of those and kind of the nitty gritty aspects of gut health and maintenance and all that with some of our experts. So I think we're, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Mm -hmm. And our next episode, we will have some, a fun one. Yeah. It's not just Thanksgiving and kind of how gut health wraps in all, 
all things Thanksgiving. Yeah. So um, I'm actually going to, well, you'll, I'll say it. I'm thinking. I'll say it in the real world. So if you did this for us, for our, um, our episode that will actually air on Thanksgiving, um, you'll get shout outs there. Cause I have an idea for the, for our Thursday episode that week. So, cause our next episode that we're going to actually talk about Thanksgiving will come out a couple of weeks before Thanksgiving. Yeah. So, um, I'm just putting this Basically out there. Basically ignore everything she just said. No, don't. I'm just already thanking you in advance. So, cause some things are going to come your way. So, um, also, yeah, if you're learning stuff, if you learned anything from this episode, please leave us a comment, send us a question, send us uh, Hey, thanks for talking about this. No one ever talks about this. Um, your send us a story. If you have a story mm-hmm. about this in the real world, um, please let us know. We want to share your story to let others know that they're not alone. Yeah. Um, and also leave us a um, five-star review and anywhere you listen to podcasts, that's very, very helpful for us. Um, and share us out because we can only get to the ears that um, we get in front of their eyes. So does that make sense? Yes. If you're not sharing us, we can't they think can't, about that. They can't listen. You can't listen to us. Yes, please. But Be that's helpful. That's super helpful. And let us know. Go to the discovery.com forward slash podcast and submit your answers or questions um because we're gonna start doing mailbag so we had a mailbag yes. from a seven-year-old we question did. it was such a good question and we so. really want to get to the place where you guys are involved and active and we're answering things that you have questions about as you're listening to these so please don't hesitate to drop us a question that we can answer on the podcast because if you have that question chances are a lot of other people do too yeah so so yeah. until next time Let's discover discover together. Hey, discover. Let's discover more. Find episode link in today's show notes. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok at the discovery doc. Connect with us on Facebook at the discovery doc. Like, and subscribe on YouTube. Find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Visit our website, the discovery doc.com. This podcast is produced by soulpreneurs association and powered by soulsoftware.co empowering your digital journey with innovative solutions. The content provided in this podcast provides general information and discussions on various topics related to health, wellness, and medical advancements. However, it is essential to understand that the content provided in this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The hosts, guests, and contributors are individuals sharing their personal experiences, opinions, and knowledge in their respective fields. While they strive to provide accurate, up-to-date information, medical knowledge is constantly evolving and the information presented in this podcast may not always reflect the most current research and medical guidelines. It is crucial to consult with a qualified healthcare professional or medical expert for specific medical concerns. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking medical treatment based on the information presented in this podcast. The Discovery Doc Podcast encourages listeners to use their own judgment and discretion while implementing any suggestions, recommendations, or lifestyle changes discussed in this episode. Each individual's medical situation is unique and may work for one, may not be suitable or safe for another. The podcast hosts, guests, and contributors are not liable for any direct, indirect, consequential, or incidental damages or harm that may arise from listening or acting upon the information provided in this podcast. Listeners are responsible for their own health decisions and should exercise caution and seek professional guidance when necessary. By listening to this podcast, you acknowledge that you have read, understood, and agreed to this medical disclaimer. If you have any questions or concerns about this medical disclaimer, please consult a qualified healthcare professional.